This is the Jungle Boy, and you are watching Wrestling with Regret. John Cena. That's pretty much how I expected it to go. For the last 15 years, for better or for worse, John Cena has been the face of WWE. Even though his roles diminished greatly over the last three of those years, he's still seen by many as the company's biggest star. These days, the overall consensus regarding the 16-time world champion is that his in-ring work got really good over the last several years, often having the best matches on any given card. Not only that, he's been a fantastic ambassador for the company through his work in the media and his time spent with Make-A-Wish and other various charities. But despite all that, for many fans, there still exists a bitter resentment toward the good doctor. Sure, he can put on good matches now, but in the early part of his mega push in the mid-2000s, that was far from the case. Cena was still very green when working esteemed veterans like Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle, Shawn Michaels, and Triple H, and at times, he looked exposed. He was meant to be the babyface in all those encounters, but ended up being the one getting booed out of the building. Nevertheless, WWE persisted in making Toilet Dinner the number one man of the company, leaving several promising talent wrecked in his wake, both in the ring and out of it. It's a topic you've demanded for years, and for a while I thought I would never get around to it. But just like old JC kicking out somebody's finisher, you knew it was bound to happen eventually. This week, I'm going to rank them the top eight biggest victims of John Cena. Word life. Number eight, Rene Dupree. By the end of 2003, John Cena had blossomed into one of the company's biggest accidental babyfaces. His white rapper gimmick, originally met with resounding boos, grew to be loved by the fans, and he was off to the races the following year. Cena's official coronation took place at WrestleMania 20 when he bested the Big Show to win the US Championship, his first gold in WWE. His first major feud as champ was against Rene Dupree, the 20-year-old second-generation prodigy from French Canada and a former world tag champ with La Resistance. Dupree was even named the number one pick in the 2004 draft lottery earlier in the year, so it seemed the company was high on him as well. But once their rivalry began, it was completely one-sided. The two men waged war over the championship for more than two months across television and paper view with Cena winning handily nearly every time. Dupree's lone singles victory came on the SmackDown after their first match at Judgment Day by countout naturally. Rene was able to score another win against Cena on the July 13th edition of SmackDown, but that was in a three-on-one handicap match alongside fellow title contenders Kenzo Suzuki and Booker T. So yeah, still not looking that strong. After being repeatedly embarrassed by Cena, Dupree would go on to have a couple of tag title reigns on the Blue Show with Suzuki, but it was clear the master of the French tickler had peaked. By the end of 2005, he was back in OVW and later released, never able to reach his full potential on the big stage. It was the first example of a pattern we'd go on to see for a very long time. Number 7. Umaga in the mid-2000s, the wrestling world belonged to Samoa Joe. One of the best workers to come out of the West Coast, Joe built a legacy for himself in Ring of Honor and TNA, piling up the wins and championships everywhere he went. There were other stars around him, sure, but at that time, Joe was the talk of the industry. Fast forward to April of 2006, when Jamal of 3 Minute Warning was repackaged as Umaga. Right away, fans questioned WWE's motives in creating this character, with some outright accusing the company of trying to create their own Samoa Joe. I don't know about you, but aside from the fact they're both Samoan, I don't see the resemblance. That'd be like saying Drew Galloway was Impact answer to The Undertaker because he is also tall and has long dark hair. The Samoan Bulldozer had a run of dominance that lasted for months, and outside of the occasional DQ or countout, he didn't lose a single match in all of 2006. That would change the turn of the following year when the Bulldozer ran into the wall that was John Cena. The man William Regal called Umanga first challenged Cena for the WWE Championship at New Year's Revolution. True to character, Umaga looked incredibly strong throughout the match, only losing when Cena caught him with a surprise roll-up. The two would have a rematch a mere three weeks later at the 2007 Royal Rumble. Considering how dominant Moggs looked in their first encounter, you'd think the Samoan Savage would tear the champion apart and make it count the Rumble. But even though it was a brief span between matches, it was apparently enough time for Cena to hulk up or eat his spinach or summon the power of the Warriors or whatever it is he does, as he completely 
completely smoked Umaga in their last man standing match. Umaga would remain a firm presence in the company for the next couple of years. He'd become Intercontinental Champion only to lose it to the Milan Miracle Santino Morella, and he was even Mr. McMahon's charge in the Battle of the Billionaires at WrestleMania 23 against Donald Trump and Bobby Lashley. But big loss after big loss caused his stock to plummet before his eventual release in 2009 after refusing to enter rehab. Number 6. Damian Sandow and Baron Corbin Historically, Money in the Bank can be a powerful tool for WWE wrestlers. When done right, it can take a mid-level talent and absolutely catapult them to superstardom. Then there's these two sad sacks. First, we look at Damian Sandow. The former idol Stevens was repackaged as the intellectual savior of the masses in the spring of 2012, using his oratory skills to maliciously berate the common peasants he so disdained. Ooh, I can see why this gimmick was so good. It's, it's fun to use big words like that. In July of 2013, Sandow won the SmackDown version of the Money in the Bank briefcase after double-crossing his tag team partner Cody Rhodes to do it. But with the credibility boost of winning the briefcase comes the inevitable losing record. In Damian's case, he went 1-12 in while holding the prize. One day after Hell in a Cell that October, Sandow confronted world champion John Cena and announced he'd cash in his briefcase, making the intellectual decision to strike while Cena was nursing an injured arm. But Sandow was unable to beat this one-armed man in a game of fisticuffs, losing the big match John after a near 15 minute encounter, killing not only Sandow's push, but ending his only opportunity he'd ever receive at the big gold belt. And if you can believe it, it wouldn't be the last time the company dropped the ball with him. Baron Corbin had a rocket strapped to him the moment he hit the main roster, winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 32 and earning multiple shots at the WWE Championship. At the 2017 Money in the Bank, Corbin would win the titular match and earn a shot at the championship, held at the time by the most revered of champions, Jinder Mahal. 2017 was weird, y'all. On an episode of SmackDown, Corbin tried to cash in after interrupting a match between Mahal and Cena and laying waste to them both. But a distraction on the outside by Cena led the modern-day Maharaja to retain the title in record time. This led to a match between Cena and the Lone Wolf of SummerSlam, a pedestrian match that saw Corbin lose in stunning fashion. As in, people were stunned at how fast Baron was made to look like a dorkazoid. Corbin was able to bounce back on Monday Night Raw, much to the chagrin of many a fan, but he looked like a total chump after being humiliated by Cena in two different ways. Number 5. Rusev Okay, stop me if you've heard this one before. A big foreign monster racks up an impressive unbeaten streak only to lose all his momentum at the hands of the man in jorts. Of course I'm talking about Rusev, who by 2015 was one of the most despicable heels in the company. Capitalizing on anti-Russian sentiment in America, hey it's cheap, but it works. Rusev's final insult to the red, white, and blue was by winning the United States title near the end of 2014. A rivalry was sparked between him and John Cena, the former fake Marine, which according to company logic made him as American as George Washington, and in kind of a shock, Rusev actually beat Cena in their first contest at Fastlane. A rematch was set for the title at WrestleMania 31, and they went all out for this one. Rusev's entrance was probably one of the best in recent memory, with an army of extras dressed as Russian military, complete with a gall dang tank! But much like Umaga before him, Ruru would ultimately lose to Cena despite putting on a dominant performance. The two would feud for two more pay-per-views in a Russian chain match at Extreme Rules, then in an I Quit match at Payback, both of which Rusev would lose as well. And with that series of losses, any and all momentum was halted. Oh, and don't forget they did it again in 2017 for old times' sake. Though it was technically a mid-card feud, this should have been a perfect point of elevation having somebody as high-profile as Cena involved. Yet following this, Rusev's fallen victim to disappointment after disappointment. The League of Nations, Rusev Day, Nakamusev, all have fallen over time, leaving Rusev in the lurch. Imagine how different things might have been had Rusev actually won that initial feud. Number 4. Zack Ryder Here's a rarity for the countdown, someone whose career went into a tailspin at the hands of Cena, even though the two barely wrestled each other. In late 2012, Zack Ryder, who fans had a harder time seeing than John Cena himself, had become friends with the top babyface of WWE. They teamed up occasionally, and John was even gracious enough to relinquish a WWE Championship opportunity so Ryder could get a shot at Dolph Ziggler's US title. This, of course, came after Cena already beat Ryder in a match to get that title shot in the first place, so he was just doing a favor for his widow buddy. Ryder's friendship with Cena came with a heavy price, as he frequently got beaten up by a newly remasked Kane, lost his US title, and got his heart broken by Eve Torres after Cena rescued her from the Big Red Machine. Did I mention Zack was assaulted by Kane a lot? Here's just one of the many examples of, oh fuck me, how did his ankles not turn to dust? 
I always try to avoid throwing the B word around willy-nilly, but what happened to Zach during this time was a grade A burial, the likes of which we had not seen before or since. What made things especially tragic was that Ryder had quietly become one of the most popular figures in the company thanks to his self-produced YouTube series, Z True Law Island Story. But instead of being treated like a hero in his own right, Ryder's constant victimization made him more like Jimmy Olsen to see as Superman. And with a few small exceptions, Ryder's career has never bounced back. Number 3. The Miz and R-Truth Yes, it's time for another twosome on this countdown, a pair of victims whose past intertwined in the year 2011. We begin our story with the main event of WrestleMania 27. Though Miz was able to successfully defend the WWE Championship against John Cena, it wasn't the star-making performance one would expect. Instead, The Rock's outside interference helped The Miz retain, relegating him to a prop in the overarching story of Rock vs. Cena and their twice-in-a-lifetime feud. Yes, for The Miz, walking away victorious at Mania 27 came with a price. Well, two if you count the scary concussion he suffered on the outside. Meanwhile, 2011 was also a breakout year for R-Truth. Fans who only know Truth for his comic relief today may be shocked to learn there was a brief window in which he was the top heel on Raw. Among other things, this darker, unhinged side to his character gave birth to Little Jimmy, as well as this very awkward moment of R. Tizzle dressed as a Confederate soldier. Truth would get his one and only singles match with the title against Cena at Capital Punishment in Washington, D.C., only to lose thanks in part to a devastating cup of water to the face. By year's end, the two men formed an alliance known as the Awesome Truth, a pair of disgruntled employees looking to cause chaos in WWE. They peaked at that year's Survivor Series when they took on the dream team of Cena and The Rock as part of the build toward Mania 28. Rather than going totally wild at, I don't know, letting Miz and Truth score an upset by capitalizing on tension between Cena and Rock, the status quo remained intact on this night. Instead of building up two stars who could have helped elevate the company's upper mid-card and main event scene in the long term, Miz and Truth were squandered for the sake of the shorter term payoff between Rock and Cena, and it would take years before either man regained any semblance of credibility. The only consolation is that if Miz and Truth actually were given serious pushes around this time, we probably would have never had this moment to enjoy. Number 2. Bray Wyatt I gotta tell you, at the time this video is coming out, there is a lot of hype surrounding Bray Wyatt. He has this unique, instantly recognizable look and presentation, his promos are great, he's gonna be a star. Is what I also thought about him about five years ago. The Wyatt family's debut in the summer of 2013 was a watershed moment for the year that was. A gimmick that was completely out there compared to everything else WWE was doing at the time, this cult with an Evergladian feel to it was playing mind games with the entire roster, all leading up to an attack on John Cena at the 2014 Rumble and again at Elimination Chamber. Once the match was set for WrestleMania, the Eater of Worlds vowed to destroy John Cena's legacy, which... I guess. I mean, God, seeing the one so much by this point, a few losses here and there wouldn't have hurt his legacy. If you really want to hurt the man's legacy, have him wrestle Goldberg in Saudi Arabia. Bray was going whole hog with the mind games at this point, doing one of the scariest things imaginable, hiring a local children's choir. He's got the little bitty babies in his head. Ah, they're so adorable, my eyes! Sure enough, Cena beat the master of Bray Sanity clean as a whistle, one of the many disappointing in hindsight things to look back on about WrestleMania 30. Bray did get his win back at Extreme Rules in a steel cage match after assistance by Harper, Rowan, and another scary child. <laughs> ah, I just want to pinch his cheeks, it's terrifying! Ultimately, their last man standing match at Payback would prove to be an exercise in subtlety. Cena would walk away victorious after literally burying Wyatt under a crate. That'd be the end of Bray's singles run against the leader of the C-Nation, though in a bit of a bright spot, he would be the one to eliminate Cena three years later en route to his shocking WWE title victory at Elimination Chamber 2017. It sounds like a long way to go for a payoff, but trust me, that's by no means the longest someone had to wait to get their win back. Before I announce the number one entrant, here are a few honorable mentions. Brock Lesnar, 2012 edition. At WrestleMania 28, John Cena lost to The Rock in a match that had been more than a year in the making. The next night on Raw, things went from bad to worse for old John when Brock Lesnar appeared on WWE television for the first time since 2004. A match was made for the two at Extreme Rules, which Cena inexplicably won, pretty much destroying all Brock's momentum from his return. Now, considering how the last few years have gone, you might balk at the idea that Brock Lesnar suffered at the hands of that loss. But let me tell you, those first couple years of his return could have felt a lot different had things gone the other way. 
Had Lesnar won that first big match back, it would have further fueled John Cena's storyline that his loss to The Rock set off a domino effect that negatively impacted his life and career for the rest of that year. Not only that, Lesnar would have been 2-0 instead of 1-1 by the time he and Triple H fought at WrestleMania 29. And assuming we could go back in time and fix the outcome of that match, it would have made his bout with The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30 that much more important, and would have made every other subsequent match that Lesnar had won ever since then more important as well. It may be considered somewhat of a reach, but in my opinion, Cena winning at Extreme Rules was the absolute wrong decision. It made Brock look weak right out the gate, which ran counter to his entire gimmick. But at least we got to see a cathartic comeback at SummerSlam 2014. Alex Riley Alex Riley, the Virgil to Mrs. Ted DiBiase, watch that review here, BT Dubs, may have rarely fought Cena in the ring, but his career did seem to suffer greatly by his hand. Since being released from the company in 2016, Riley has confirmed that there was, at one point, a backstage incident between he and Cena that hurt his standing of the company. Furthermore, Ryback has said that Cena would bury Riley backstage to anybody he could. In a Reddit AMA, Tyler Rex said there was, quote, some sort of unknown, unreasonable heat between Riley and Cena that was totally uncalled for, end quote. We may never know where the beef between these two began, but a Ry never got a chance to get off the ground despite having tons of upside. Kenny Dykstra and Mickey James this dual burial was all personal, no business. According to Dykstra himself, he found out that his then fiance Mickey James was having an affair with Cena when he caught her Googling Mickey James John Cena dating to see if it leaked to the internet. This revelation led to Dykstra being moved to a different brand, slowly being transitioned off of TV, and eventually fired from the company in 2008. Meanwhile, Mickey and Cena allegedly continued their relationship through 2009 when Cena himself got married, and Mickey, desiring an actual relationship, blew up on Cena backstage. In Dykstra's words, quote, when they were together, she got the title and TV roles. When he dumped her, she became Piggy James, then was fired, end quote. Love stinks. And the number one biggest victims of John Cena were Wade Barrett and the Nexus. It should have been obvious when you heard me using plurals. Ah, the Nexus, a group of eight that soon became seven after Daniel Bryan's sudden firing, this clan of original NXT competitors joined forces as part of a hostile takeover of WWE, led by season one winner Wade Barrett. For weeks, the band of brothers terrorized the roster, leading to an epic seven-on-seven -seven confrontation at SummerSlam 2010. Despite pleas from veterans Edge and Chris Jericho that Barrett's army should have won the day, it was ultimately Cena who picked up the win for Team WWE, coming from behind and beating Justin Gabriel and then Barrett in embarrassing fashion, forcing the group to spend the rest of its existence as a feckless shell of what it originally was. Mr. Bad News was able to exact revenge on John by forcing him to join the Nexus, then later getting him fired from the company, but nothing stuck. The company refused to put Cena in any kind of position of vulnerability or adversity, as the multiple-time world champ undermined and beat up the black and yellow troop at every opportunity, turning the group into a total laughingstock. The final nail in the coffin took place at TLC of that year, when Cena beat Wade in a chairs match, then literally buried him under another dozen or so steel chairs. Despite having the look and presence of a bona fide star, Bear had a hard time staying relevant in the company until his release in 2016. Through injuries, the core, more injuries, the League of Nations, becoming the Cosmic King, well you get the idea, but the point is it all began with the failure of the Nexus. In the end, John Cena didn't just wreck the careers of one or two guys, or even three. By winning almost single-handedly at SummerSlam, Big Match John completely derailed the career paths of seven guys at once, kneecapping what should have been a money-making feud and a stable to be feared. But instead, Wade, Bear, and the Nexus are simply known as the biggest victims of John Cena. Did I miss anybody? Let me know in the comments section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Rabadoo! Oh yeah. Yeah, I can see him. I'm staring at him right now. Oh no, he's uh, he's pretty pale. He's like a like a jar of mayonnaise with eyeballs and a ketchup haircut. Quit the joke, Cena. That was funny.